civil rights movement, you had foot dragging or outright opposition from most evangelicals, white evangelicals. The feminist movement, you had a lot of anti-feminism and evangelicalism, a deep opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment and just in general to women in women's liberation, women in the workplace. Uh, of course, the gay rights movement has been resolutely opposed by evangelicals from the beginning. A lot of the problem of grassroots evangelicalism was the idea that the Bible alone would give us all the answers that we need. Well, David Gushy, you are a scholar, um, an ethicist, uh, I think an iconoclast in a way. So, David, what is an ethicist and what is a Christian ethicist? Uh, well, it's good to be in conversation with you today, my friend. Um, uh, I'm happy to start there. An ethicist is uh, somebody who helps um, people think about the moral dimension of their lives. Uh, what is right and wrong, good and bad, what kind of life is to be pursued, um, choice making, character, vision for the moral dimension of life. Um, I often identify as a social ethicist, so that's the tradition I was trained in, so that's more um, addressing public and social problems uh, and trying to think about those. A Christian ethicist is somebody who does all of that with reference to Jesus Christ and the tradition of Christianity. Um, so there are, uh, one thing I say to my students, in fact I'll say it today, I have a class today, is that the moral dimension of life is inescapable. It's just part of everybody's life Whenever we ask, what should we do, what is right, what is wrong, whenever we critique somebody's character or behavior, we're doing morality, you might say. Uh, we're dealing in the moral arena. Um, ethicists are trained professionals, often philosophers, sometimes theologians, um, biblical scholars occasionally, but it's its own field, Christian ethics. You can get a PhD in Christian ethics, uh, which I did. Um, but we... Uh, we have a specialized training in thinking about the moral dimension of life and in helping people, uh, you might say, think more seriously about what is often just a matter of culture or intuition or reaction. Yeah, and Christians do that with reference to Christ. So, uh, you know, I'm familiar with your story and have been in a few of your books uh, this past month. So... You have a story of of leaving American evangelicalism and then yet in your book still Christian, a follower of Christ. So then, David, what has been the difference between, let's say, Christian ethics and evangelical ethics? Are there, is there, or could there, is there a difference? Sure. I mean, you can put uh, a lot of different qualifiers in front of ethics. Uh, you could have secular ethics, um, Hindu ethics, Jewish ethics, Buddhist ethics. Um, you can have Kantian ethics or Rawlsian ethics or specific figures. Um, Christian ethics would be the big term for anybody who's doing their ethics with reference to the Christian faith. Um, I'm not sure there is much of a thing called evangelical ethics, to be honest. Uh, I I tried to tried what to contribute. Yeah, <laughs> I tried what do you to mean by that. Yeah, well, um, it would if there were to be an evangelical ethics, it would require there to be a coherent community called evangelicals. And I'm not sure there really is such a thing. Um, I think they they thought there was such a thing. Um, but anyway, that's an interesting conversation. Would you say American society, uh, that's an interesting statement. Would you say 21st century American society looking in, um, when you say as a scholar, you're not sure um, there is evangelical ethics, perhaps you're saying because evangelical, certainly in the last 150 years, defining that as a moving 
target. But would you say the general American society and culture looking at evangelicals, would you say, um, have they not felt uh, a Christian, uh, an evangelical ethic? Um, here's what I would say. Uh, I always date the beginning of American modern evangelicalism to the 1940s when fundamentalists attempted some fundamentalists attempted to break off and create a middle way between uh, the main line and fundamentalism. And so they, they rebranded as evangelical. They were a big tent coalition, very conservative politically, very conservative white men universally, um, Americans, uh, fundamentalists with some effort to modernize a little bit. But um, my most provocative statement would be that because there was no coherent theological tradition that united evangelicals, it was difficult for them to develop a coherent evangelical ethic. And I think that uh, eventually, I mean, it's, it's, in fact, I'm reading a dissertation right now that I'm supervising where the student says that Americanism <laughs> was the evangelical ethic. Uh, from the 50s through the 60s and then um, Christian right politics became the evangelical ethic from the 70s forward and now an awful lot of uh, Trumpist MAGA stuff is the evangelical ethic today um, now there were scholars in evangelical colleges and seminaries who were trying to do better and for a long time I was one of them but but I would say evangelicalism in the U.S. never developed a coherent teaching tradition or body of reflection that was strong enough to resist the currents of political involvement and uh, Christian nationalism and all of that. That, we, that. that is what people see when they look at evangelicals today. Yeah, so, uh, and so when people, you know, general society or culture look at let's say, evangelical stand on homosexuality, uh, traditional marriage, when they look at um, even death penalty and, uh, and gun laws, when they look at abortion, would general society and, and certainly maybe the left go, oh, we, we, see, a, we see a ethic branded Christian, would they not? Um, there is a, there is a, a politics uh. um, and a, a partisan identification. Um, an interesting pattern of the political uh, stances uh, tracking very nicely with whatever the Republican Party was saying at a given time, which always raises questions. If, if any Christian community's ethics is indistinguishable from that of a political party, then you then you don't have Christian ethics. You have a political party's ethics, maybe with a little bit of Christian overlay, like veneer, yeah. on top of it. Wait, da um, yeah, I was good. David. What about? Um, I mean, you're a minister, a pastor. I've been a, a minister. Are there not plenty of pulpits? And I think of my evangelical days, and I'm no longer an evangelical. But I came up through that church growth movement in the 90s, the Willow Creek mm -hmm. movement, you know, then, then the North Point, where, <clears throat> so haven't there been plenty of pulpits that have taught an ethic that we may label politically right wing, certainly, because politics got involved in abortion, death penalty, homosexuality, uh, birth control, certainly politics got involved in that. But were there not plenty of pulpits leaving out the politics of that than teaching, in a sense, that those moral ethics? Yeah, um, so, so let's just, let's say that out there in among the thousands and thousands of churches that identified as evangelical, some people were teaching and preaching something. Okay, so what what were they doing? Well, one way to say it is that the more conservative ones were preaching what they thought the Bible taught. Right. Um, and, and so 
now there was maybe some difference of opinion, but I mean, uh, abortion is an interesting question because there's no direct address of abortion anywhere in the Bible. Um, and so to say that I'm just kind of preaching what the Bible teaches, that's an interesting problem from the beginning on abortion, right? Um, homosexuality, yes, you can make the case from six verses of a negative posture. Uh, um, but, but I actually think that a lot of the problem of grassroots evangelicalism was the idea that the Bible alone would give us all the answers that we need. And then the Bible as interpreted by the pastor with sometimes good and sometimes not very good training, hmm. rushing to put together messages week by week and not really in conversation with a broader tradition of reflection that you can find in Christianity. There's 2,000 years of Christian reflection on most issues that are important. And so I would, uh, I would say that on the evangelical side, biblicism actually undercut the development of a coherent ethic because the idea was you could just read your ethic off of the Bible and maybe the way you do that is go to a concordance and look for every reference to an issue and construct a sermon or even just pick one passage and you've got your, your teaching. And then a lot of improv, kind of fly by the seat of the pants um, improv, and all in the context of an ideological, um, a very powerful ideological context in which, for example, Cold War anti-communism or flag-waving American patriotism or increasingly Republican Party loyalty is actually setting the horizon of all conversations. That's what I would say. Do you buy the, do you buy the general historic analysis that the evangelicals of the 40s and 50s and 60s um, didn't necessarily have a view on abortion or right to life. That didn't come until Jerry Falwell. And then through the 70s and, of course, then the moral majority of the 80s and then the leftover in the 90s and then the Reagan presidency, that all changed. Do you, do you buy that as a general, that evangelicals, you might have found a pro-choice evangelical in the 60s or 50s, certainly wasn't a political issue then, but then it was Jerry Falwell uh, and the moral majorities tethering to the Reagan uh, presidency, that all changed. Is It's a general thing we hear. Do you buy that? Yeah, um, you can do a content analysis of like what Christianity Day magazine was saying about abortion in the 60s and early 70s. And um, uh, from one study that I saw, it was kind of all over the place, you know. Uh, you could make a, a pro-choice case. Uh, the Bible, because the Bible says nothing about abortion, there was, again, improvising based on principles or readings of the situation or whatever. When the states began loosening their abortion laws, some of them, in the 60s, it began to be more of a political issue. But it was really the Roe v. Wade decision of 1973 uh, establishing, you know, the uh, abortion rights the way that they did in the, on their trimester scheme. But it, even then, right away, evangelicals were not on board. Um, oh, evangelicals decided to be on board I think Randall Balmer makes a pretty persuasive case that they decided to be on board on abortion really only only because they concluded that it was a more uh, palatable and possibly appealing and morally um, clear, maybe, uh, from, from a perspective issue compared to um, what really got people like Jerry Falwell going in the 60s, which was uh, forced desegregation of... of um, schools and neighborhoods and businesses and and uh, Christian colleges and so on. So it's pretty clear that the Southern preachers, Southern white preachers who got involved in the Christian right, the initial inflammation was over desegregation in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. The issue that became the rallying cry was abortion. And it, the other great benefit politically for that was it was able to to build a Catholic evangelical coalition because the Catholics were 
anti-abortion with more clarity for a longer period of time. And so, and actually, I, I've been in a lot of rooms in which it was pretty clear to me that the moral argumentation on abortion was being provided by Catholic moral theology. The evangelicals had not really developed their independent um, way of attacking that issue. So is, um, so then from a, a, let's say, somebody wanting to live out a Christian morality, uh, and you and I have a background where there where some would have said there is one absolute Christian morality, and then many times in Americanism and American Christianism, and I'm using that term purposely, uh, it is sided with an absolutist, there is one morality. So how do you deal with your students? Is there, as, a, as an ethicist, and certainly a, a religious scholar, uh, how do you answer? Is there one religious or Christian religious morality? Uh, factually, there's definitely not just one. Um, there's 2,000 years of, of evidence to show that we've been arguing about these questions from the beginning. Um, uh, some early arguments had to do with uh, gender roles and uh, the, the um, handling of economic life. Are we allowed to have personal property or are we supposed to share it? Um, how much are we supposed to give and how, right? Um, the question of violence surfaced pretty early. Are we allowed to retaliate if we are wronged? Um, a relationship to the state under the Roman Empire was an issue from the beginning. Um, you know, so um, yes, I would say say sexuality um, are we allowed to get married uh, you know what are the rules for marriage uh, are we allowed to get divorced that's even in the New Testament you can see they were arguing about the legitimacy of divorce you can see it already in the text um, so so then picture a church that is divided into three main groups Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholic and Protestant and then think of all the different Protestant groups and then think of 2,000 years of arguments within each individual tradition as well as across the traditions. Um, one way to teach any ethical um, field or any ethical um, conversation is to talk about communities arguing within themselves over time. I do think you can see some broad lines of tradition and even consensus, mainly set by the towering example of Jesus, but that consensus, and you have to teach that, you have to talk about that, but but there's lots and lots of arguments too, and lots of failures, because you can develop standards and then not live up to your own standards. You know, I, I'm sure, I know you are, but I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, work of R. Marie Griffith at Washington University and uh, in, yeah. in her book, Moral Combat. And then, of course, um, Molly Worthen uh, in her book, Apostles of Reason. David, it seems, you know, fast forwarding to the 20th century, you know, really looking at American evangelicalism the last 100 years, specifically in ethics and morality, it seems on some major moral issues that society had adopted that American, whether it was fundamentalism in the early part of the century and then post-1940 on American evangelicalism, it was always late to the party on moral issues when it came to civil rights, race, interracial marriage, birth control, immigration, reproductive rights, gun control, LGBT issues. Why, why, why have relatively uh, modern evangelicals, 100 years or so, why have, why have they been late to what society has adopted as a moral ethic? Yeah. Um, it wasn't everybody uh, in evangelicalism. There, there was, not as much now, but there was a center and a left in evangelicalism. And, I mean, I worked with one of the 
actually two of the icons of the left wing of evangelicalism in Jim Wallace and Ron Sider. So if, if anybody listening knows those names, they know of... By the way, does Jim Wallace, yeah. does Jim Wallace still consider himself an evangelical? Uh, probably not. Right. But, no. but cer- Ron Sider, certainly in the... Sider course. did. To, okay. Mm-hmm, yeah, Sider did to the day he died. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a Canadian Mennonite evangelical. So he was a pacifist, mm-hmm. egalitarian simple living he wrote rich christians in an age of hunger in the 70s the book that really changed the conversation so he was challenging american consumerism and capitalism um uh, he was an environmentalist he was deeply committed to racial justice and he was a he was a, a deeply committed evangelical so so there were voices like that but they were largely drowned out or defeated in moral combat by um, by the right wing types, um, who in general took a conservative or even reactionary posture on every issue that you named, um, and there's other ones too. Uh, and so my book on democracy, defending democracy from its Christian enemies, that came out in October, is really about how it is that certain parts of the Christian community just position themselves as reactionary, negative reactionaries to to every social change. And that this is not a healthy ethics or politics. And you can see it from the from the sixties forward. Once our our society divided over progressive social change, and most evangelicals and the evangelical power structure generally took the conservative posture on everything. So go back to the 60s, civil rights movement, you know, you had foot dragging or outright opposition from most evangelicals, white evangelicals. Um, uh, The feminist movement, you had a lot of anti-feminism in evangelicalism, a deep opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment and just in general to women's liberation, women in the workplace. of course, the gay rights movement has been resolutely opposed by evangelicals from the beginning. Immigration. Now, that's an issue where there is plenty of biblical evidence for why we should look at every person as precious, made in the image of God. And xenophobia should have nothing to do with Christianity, but it got into the marrow of a lot of right wing Christianity. Um, uh, the uh, prayer in schools decision, I think it was 1962 by the Supreme Court, you had evangelicals and still have evangelicals who want a more of a Christian establishment in in public life. Um, so yes, the outside world looking in would say, oh, the evangelicals, they're the ones who are against every inclusive social change. Um, I should mention, by the way, I used to work a lot on the torture issue after 9/11 when the U.S. started torturing people. Right. I was in. I, I led a movement uh, against that. We did some polling once, and we found, no surprise, that the most pro-torture religious community in the U.S. in 2008 was evangelicals. Yeah. Um, you know, you name it: retrograde um, reaction which involved a diminishing of the rights and value of lots of populations um, was a routine feature, which then leads to the most searching questions about, well, what is it actually that is driving or was driving, is driving this community? And what does it have to do with Jesus? And a lot of us have left because we're sure that it doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. In fact, Jesus Jesus would stand on the other side of a lot of of what that movement has been about. Yeah, so whether it's your wording, whether it was dragging their feet, my wording, uh, late to the party, um, mm-hmm. what drove... Or n- not going to the party, because yeah. you don't want to go to the party, yeah, right, right? right, not even want to <laughs> go, um, yeah. or think the party's even wrong. Uh, what, it, right. what, yeah. what was that? Was it biblicism? Was it biblical literalism? What did it? And did we... I mean, on some, maybe on some things, um, <laughs> like on, uh, homosexuality, uh, you know they were quite sure that was ruled out biblically um so but on on feminism a lot of those arguments were biblical but um and how about militarism i didn't mention when there was a big fight over the legitimacy of the vietnam war 
most white evangelicals were on the pro-Vietnam War side, you know, and against the peace marchers in the streets and so on. When there was worry over the buildup of nuclear weapons that could annihilate the planet and conservative evangelicals position themselves with the cold warriors, you know, and not the peace activists. Um, after a while, you see such a consistent pattern that really all you have to ask is, in American cultural divisions, what are the progressives saying? The evangelicals would be on the opposite side, just by definition. Same with environment, by the way. There's no, there's no obvious, quote unquote, biblical reason why evangelicals should should not believe in climate change or not care about it or not worry about uh, clean water or, uh, or you know, toxins in the soil. I mean, you think there'd be some pretty good reasons to care about that biblically. But when that became identified as a progressive issue, they were going to be against it. Which, again, leads to the, to the recognition that a lot of what ended up being the quote-unquote evangelical ethic was the politics, and the politics was borrowed from the right wing uh, of the Republican Party, and so there wasn't coherent uh, ethics. And all you really have to do is compare that posture to what uh, I teach from an Eastern Orthodox teaching document. It's over here. It's called For the Life of the World. I teach from this, and there's Roman Catholic teaching documents too. Um, they are not able to be pigeonholed as consistently conservative or liberal because they're operating from a tradition that is older than our left-right binary and that will surprise you sometimes. So the Orthodox teaching document is very committed to environmental concern and to economic simplicity. They also happen to be conservative on, like, abortion. Okay, That's just where they are. But, but evangelicals didn't have that kind of teaching tradition that would keep them from just falling into whatever the right wing was saying at a given time. And so that's where the ethics came from, and that is part of the problem, a big part of the problem. <clears throat> David, a big, obviously a big part of what you do uh, daily is you teach young students and um, on these issues. Um, where does social science, the, where does the development of social science and the development of psychological science, uh, where does it or should it affect a moral ethic and then a religious moral ethic? Um, good question. One of the things I'll actually be talking about today in class is this question, where do we go to get input into our moral thinking, right? Um, I call this the sources of authority question. And so, for example, if you want to think about this question, what should Christians th uh, do about climate change? Let's just start there. Okay. Um, that's a moral question because you're asking a should question. What should we do? Uh, how, what kind of car should we drive if we drive at all? Uh, should we fly anywhere? Do we do carbon offsets? You know, uh, uh, what public policy should we recommend in relation to climate change? Those are those are classic questions of social ethics, right? Well, to even begin to analyze an issue like that, you have to understand the science as well as you can. That means somebody in the Christian community needs to be able to be a part of, or at least to understand, the scientific documentation of climate change. You have to be reading the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which comes out with massive reports every few years. You have to be able to have somebody understand and read that and help make sense of that for the Christian community. Um, and that would be true on every issue. Uh, what should the church uh, think about um, uh, economic inequality in America? The vast gap between the rich and the poor. Well, to even have an opinion that's intelligent, you have to read economics. You have to study this. So in other words, and, and okay, now let's go over to sexuality. What should the church teach and do about sexuality, including, say, uh, LGBTQ questions? Well, it might be helpful to know something about sexuality and gender. And who has that information? Well, uh, you have a lot of uh, specialists, clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, social scientists who study it. So... 
I teach a version of Christian ethics in which I say you bring the resources of the faith, including the Bible, into conversation with the scientists. And if you don't do that, you're just doing a kind of a naive biblicism. And, and then you're doing some very poorly informed, often quite damaging preaching and teaching. You know, so take the trans issue. So clearly we have, we have issues related to gender identity and gender dysphoria and what to do about it and so on. And then somebody comes in the pulpit and says, well, all we need are personal narratives or, or listen to the clinicians who work with uh, trans folks. Um, all we need is Genesis 1. That's fundamentalism, really. Um, and how many, how many really um, harmful, if not just worthless, kinds of pronouncements have been made by people who don't know anything about the actual issues they're talking about, but they think they know everything they need to know because they've read a few verses in the Bible. Right. So, David, how, you've used the word biblicism. I have, too. Just for the folks, maybe, that, that uh, listening that don't, aren't familiar with that term. Could you briefly describe <laughs> what biblicism is? I know it's also part of a moving target, but give it a shot. Um, well, here's a descriptive definition. A uh, biblicist is somebody who believes that all answers that we need for moral questions or theological questions are found solely in the Bible. Right. And I'm no, I was a biblicist. I no longer am a, a biblicist, but like you, I still consider myself still a uh, Christian. Christian spirituality is still an, uh, an important part of my religious uh, existential practice. So, so then, David, can two Christians end up with two different moral? paths, and a lousy wording on all of this, but uh, and very colloquial. So can two different Christians have two different moral paths, and they are both good, devout Christians? Yes. How so? Um, I don't, I don't think that that's um, as simple as saying one, you know, anything goes, anybody's moral judgments cannot be challenged by anybody else. I'm not saying that. That's moral relativism, and I'm not a moral relativist. Um, <clears throat> but there are numerous examples of, of Christians, devout Christians, Bible-believing Christians. Remember that phrase? Oh, yeah. Um, serious, prayerful Christians, uh, even extremely intelligent, well-studied Christians uh, coming out on different places, on different issues. Um, uh, a great example is the issue of violence and participation in support of the military and military activity. Uh, that goes back, as I said, early, early on. Um, and, and so it, it is just not true that you can say there's one Christian position on the use of military force. There just isn't. Um, and so in any military situation, you have Christians in the armed forces and other Christians who are walking outside the, the facility with their signs, you know. Um, same thing with economics. Uh, uh, is a Christian allowed to have, a, uh, to, to possess more than, let's pick a figure, $500,000? Um, there are many Christian voices that would say, no, anything more than meeting daily needs uh, is theft from the poor. Uh, meanwhile, you've got Christian philanthropists who are multimillionaires who, who believe that their path is make a lot of money and give a lot of money away. Right? Um, who's right? We've been arguing about it for 2,000 years. Now, there, again, there is no Christian path to genocide, like, hey, you know, that's okay, or there is no, for me, there's no Christian path to xenophobia. It's completely ruled out, and there's nothing in the tradition that's okay with it. Um, and so there are certain things that are ruled out, but there are other issues that are matters of perennial debate. Um, how about this one today? Um, people who believe that we ought to open the door 
very carefully to physician assisted suicide uh, or physician assisted or aid in dying versus those who think that's a line that must not be crossed my students have very vigorous arguments about that question and they they end they end up on different places for very good reason um, so I find it interesting to you know teach the debate and actually I have my students learn how to debate these issues I say okay let's let's set up a debate and see where you end up um, so and wouldn't it be nice if churches could be places where we could have those conversations uh, civilly constructively intelligently and learn um, from the differences as well as from the commonalities yeah yeah so uh, you and I, like I was a, I was an evangelical of the 80s, and I think you and I are around the same age, pretty mm -hmm. close. Uh, so I was a young evangelical at 18, 19, 20 years old, a Campus Crusade kid in college. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you know that world, and now you're in academia, you're around students. Is the, is the conservative Christian kid of our era and the conservative hmm. Christian kid of now, are they different and how are they different? Are their morals and ethics different? What a great question. Um, let me think about my undergrads uh, in Macon at Mercer. Um, I would say uh, there's a lot fewer at a, I mean Mercer is a is a Baptist semi kind of post Baptist university um, but there's a lot fewer of the down the line conservative evangelical kids than there would have been when we were coming through um, and there's a lot more of the I want nothing to do with religion or Christianity because it's harmful and we see that in polling of this generation there's a an activated group of not just I'm indifferent but I'm actively opposed mm. Christian by the way evangelicalism helped to contribute to that evangelicalism helped to create that yeah I, I've often said isn't it a, a, an amazing irony that the faith mission of a religion or a particular version of Christianity that wanted to reach people the most is polling as those who chase the most people away no yeah and there's so much anecdotal evidence of that and the the constant crusades against lgbtq people is a big part of of that mm -hmm. um um but if you take that that group of conservative evangelical kids they you would recognize them they're 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 pretty similar um they're in bible study groups they go to campus crusade they go to ruf um, they go to the Baptist group, um, they're reading their Bibles, they're having devotional times, they're uh, singing the praise choruses, they're telling people about Jesus, they're going on mission trips. They're trying to find a Christian spouse to marry. Uh, they're more marriage oriented, by the way, they usually want to get married. Mm. Um, they're trying to avoid having sex before getting married, you know. Um, uh, you know, so they're, they're similar, they're, they're still there. Um, a subset of the subset are the heavily politically activated ones but but it's kind of a different audience too you know um maga evangelicals are a, you might say a different breed yeah you know yep um the still that kind of love jesus love neighbor love the bible in a lot of ways that that was the best of that of that world and I mean that was what attracted me when I wandered into a Southern Baptist Church as you know from reading my memoir you know and and you know they just loved me and they they accepted me and they worked with me and they taught me about the faith and they overlooked my mistakes and they they you know they they offered love not politics yeah and I want to come back to that in a moment but I, I want to hang here for yeah on uh, morals and ethics. Uh, mm -hmm. A moment ago, you had said um, you're not a moral relativist. And part of my journey in this, uh, there was a time where I would have said I'm a moral absolutist. Uh, and that really came from my biblicism, mm -hmm. uh, my strong right 
evangelicalism and not necessarily right politically. I always considered, even when I was a, a flaming evangelical, I, I still considered myself a centrist uh, politically. Um, uh, I, I always said I left the party, I left the Republican Party, I left it in 1992 because of Newt Gingrich, actually, ah. his, <laughs> his contract with America. And I was pretty young then. But anyway, yeah. I'm no longer a, a, a moral absolutist. I'm certainly not a moral um, relativist, licking my finger, sticking it in the air and letting the winds of culture, right. which I'm often uh, criticized for. I'm a moral relativist. But I really side with what Jonathan Haidt, as he defines it, that I consider myself a moral evolutionist, that I believe morals and ethics evolve. Mm -hmm. And then kind of my thing that evolves them are two things, wisdom, Meaning we develop as a, whether it's social science, psychological science, biological science, astrophysics, whether we just human development, mm -hmm. we get wiser, kind of, we used to think that, but that's not what we think anymore. And then I think the second thing that um, helps morals evolve in a sane way is then empathy or love. This is to combat the one that says, well, aren't you on a slippery slope? And I go, well, if we're applying wisdom and empathy, uh, there's no such thing as a slippery slope. I, I think a great example of that, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, was the Me Too movement. So it was obviously always wrong mm -hmm. to pinch a secretary's um, behind in the workplace. That was always wrong. But why could you get away with it then, and suddenly now you can't get away with it? Again, it was always wrong. Well, we've, we've gotten wiser. Uh, we've become more empathetic. We understand what women have experienced in, since the industrial era, what a woman experiences in the um, workplace. So this concept of moral evolution, <clears throat> Um, is that a sane approach that that we can even as Christian followers we can go I hold to I don't hold to moral absolutes I hold to that morals and ethics evolve um, mainly I agree with that uh, I do I do think there are countless examples of things Christians used to accept that we no longer accept and things we used to reject that we no longer reject. Um, in theology, this is called development of doctrine. Um, so our moral doctrine has evolved. Uh, again, having a historical sensibility really helps here. Um, mm -hmm. Centuries of Christian anti-Semitism taught by the church. We're, we've made a lot of progress past that, though it took the shock of the Holocaust to do it. Um, during colonialism, there were active debates as to whether indigenous people had souls. Nobody's having that debate now, right? Um, for centuries, there were debates over whether the enslavement of certain populations was okay. Uh, we're not having that debate now. Um, the most grotesque misogyny was taught as Christian doctrine for centuries. Sometimes it still is, but not as often we've made progress, right? Um, so there is such a thing as moral progress and moral evolution and growing wisdom. And in general, a good test is, is it movement in the direction of honoring the image of God in all people? Um, caring about the well-being of all people, not just some people. Movement towards justice, movement towards dignity, towards equality, towards giving life and and in embracing human flourishing for more and more people. That's wisdom. And then empathy is a big part of that. I care about what happens to your child, not just my child. Right? <laughs> right. Um, now, I don't embrace a kind of a linear, the whole story of morality is, is positive, upward, evolutionary progress, because that isn't true. Um, 
for example, I think that the ancients um, knew a whole lot better about how to live sustainably with Earth than we have since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I think that our go-go capitalism eats up human life and that's not progress even though maybe there's been economic progress by some indicators, right? Um, I think that media and technology is always a, like it's always a double-edged sword. There are good things that happen like we can have this conversation say media and technology but there's also uh, what we know about what social media is doing to teenagers right so um, I think human culture progresses in fits and starts and there's negatives and positives with almost every new innovation um, right so far there's been a, a pattern of self-correction we maybe we learn something and then we correct and then we do better but but there are also reasons to be afraid that in the end our self-correction will not be sufficient or in time and i hear that and and to yeah would you would you not say especially a moment ago when you said having a historic outlook a historic awareness helps so would and I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, the work of Steven Pinker mm -hmm. at Harvard. So, so are we morally inclining? Are we on a moral and ethic incline as a species, or are we on a moral decline? Or is that too general of a question? Meaning, some places we are on a moral incline, some on a decline. But then I'll add this and let you comment: Is there a catch-up? Meaning. When something, when an innovation is introduced, uh, they're like, let's say, I, I, I don't, I don't know that much uh, about weapons or weaponry. So when weapons were introduced, you know, there was uh, an awful, awful things with them. But then over time, things, I, I don't know. I, I probably shouldn't have gone down that rabbit hole. But let's say social media. Social media is relatively young. Te the computer, the desktop computer is relatively young. Does this not morally look different in 100 years 500 years do we develop or do we decline that's uh in some ways that's an empirical question and in some ways it's a theological question isn't it right sure, sure um of course and i mean the development of the technology of of warfare uh is a a real cautionary tale i mean uh the 20th century saw grotesque mass destruction in two wars and then we develop atomic and nuclear weapons which we now threaten each other with on a daily basis um, waiting in their silos and submarines and planes um, but it is true that for 75 years we haven't used them it's a blink of an eye in history whether we can not use them for another 750 years it's kind of hard to believe um, or if the state doesn't use them in some sort of radical or terrorist group gets right, pulled, uh, right, yeah. So I mean, so our technology of destruction is nightmarish in its capacity. Um, there, I think. Well, I remember the Jewish traditions, uh, moral tradition talks about the good impulse and the evil impulse. Yetzer hara and yetzer hatov, constantly battling. And um, and I, I actually like this image better than either a kind of a st optimism or pessimism as an overall posture. I think human life is full of choices and struggles, both individually and collectively, and the outcome is not predetermined. We make those choices and we decide. Um, so. Uh, any a kind of a blanket optimism is naive, but a blanket pessimism is also not realistic. And so, so I, I tend to take it case by case, issue by issue, depending on how I see things, how I see things developing, you know. Uh, you know, much of the second half of the 20th century, if certainly the last quarter of the 20th century, uh, 
when it came to Christian or American evangelical ethics, much of the focus was on sexuality. Mm-hmm. Whether it was traditional marriage, whether it was uh, non-inclusiveness for gay people, now we're seeing it in the 21st with trans, and then of course uh, the abstinence uh, push. Yeah. Um, from a religious standpoint, where are we and where are we headed on a uh, sexual ethic or sexual rights? Um, I think that uh, one way to think about this issue is um, order uh, versus justice as the two competing priorities. So let's let's play with that for a second. I think that a lot of the um, the shape of Christian moral tradition uh, on sexuality and marriage has been desperately concerned to order family life and sexual expression so as to prevent chaos in uh, in interpersonal relations. So, so we need to constrain people's expression of sexuality um, using whatever social control we have available, um, and and then create an institution which becomes the normative outlet for sexuality, and that becomes traditional marriage between a man and a woman, and then. Th- it's easy to forget this because it isn't emphasized as much now, which is itself interesting. And then to keep people married, even if they're not very happy. So marry them young, uh, try to ban or limit divorce, confine childbirth to marriage, and roll on generation after generation. Okay? Why? Because the idea was, well, the Bible said so, but also because uh, sexuality is a powerful force that if left unconstrained creates chaos hurts people um, uh, creates heartbreak and rage like like if people are unfaithful and the other person gets upset right um, and risk uh, the birth of children in unstable or unsatisfactory environments or abortion if that's the path that is taken. Um, and so I, in my, all of my writing about sexuality, I try to say this kind of ordering function should not just be dismissed because I do think to some extent we depend on some ordering of sexuality and relationships so we don't live in constant chaos and turmoil. And most of us seek stability and love and um, something lasting and something that is life-giving and something that is not chaotic every day, at least over the long term. Maybe not when we're 18, but maybe when we're 35, right? Um, Now, so that's the ordering side, and I don't want to dismiss its significance. That's why I've always been an advocate for marriage, and I'm I'm a fan of good marriage. I'm also not a fan of easy divorce. So call me a conservative on that. Um, But the justice side is, um, let's say justice and freedom, not everybody fits the old paradigm. Um, There are people who are not wired for opposite sex interaction and what space do we make for them? Uh, There are people whose gender identity is not clearly male or female. What do we do with and for them. Um, There are people who don't want to get married, but they still look for intimacy, or they can't get married, or even legally it would be bad for them to get married, what happens for them. Um, There are people whose marriages are so, so, they're not flourishing, what do we do with them, for them? And then there are people whose marriages are disastrous. Now, generally the church is now getting that if a disastrous marriage should be exited, but it took a long time to get there, a long time. Um, And so, so the concern for order 
is now more balanced with the concern for liberty and flourishing and justice and rights for the part on the part of the people who um, don't fit or are not having success with the traditional orderly paradigm. And and I think a great revolution of the latter part of the 20th century, early part of the 21st century, was to make more choices available and to take more seriously the needs and the suffering of all the people who don't fit the traditional paradigm. And I think that's kind of where sexual ethics remains balanced or should remain balanced. Understanding the need for some way of ordering our relational, erotic, sexual expression and and also understanding uh, the vast diversity of human beings and human relationships and the need to go with people where they are and help them find a path of flourishing for them. Um, and that's what I think, I, you know, my work on LGBT inclusion, I mean, that that's ought to be a pretty simple case. Five to 10%, maybe less, maybe a little more, not heterosexual. We tried to stuff them into a heterosexual paradigm for millennia, force them to get married, uh, force them to b pretend uh, to be what they weren't at great psychological harm and great relational catastrophe. And now a lot of us have said no more of that. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I think that's progress. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so with morals and ethics, especially for the person who wants to live out their Christian spirituality. Obviously, part of our Christian spirituality is the ancient scriptures. We've kind of touched on it's uh, when it's when the ancient scriptures are biblicized or literal or fundamental mm -hmm. or talked about from a very sliver of a pie. Somebody is defining a version of the scriptures. So in, in somebody living out their Christian spirituality and yet is trying to find this order you speak of uh, that helps the health of life um, and health of spirituality, where do the scriptures I come think in? that um, this is such a solvable problem <laughs> that uh, I, do, I think this is a solvable problem. Um, that fundamentalism and evangelicalism uh, made much more difficult than it needed to be. Uh, I've, in my book, After Evangelicalism, I talk about um, that the, the Bible belongs to the church. It belongs to the world, really, but from a Christian perspective, it belongs to the church, which developed and curated it. It also belongs to the Jewish people. We took you know, their Bible and made it ours, uh, you know, sometimes doing violence to their Bible in the process, right? And to them that I talk about as well. But, but now let's take about, let's talk about the Bible that we have, um, Hebrew Bible and New Testament, Christian scriptures, 66 books, the Protestant Bible, 31,000 verses. It is full of treasures, full of treasures. It's also full of things that are not treasures. And the role of the church and Christian leaders is to bring out from the Bible the treasures and to put them in front of people for um, the spiritual enrichment of everybody who is, who is ready to hear what these texts say. Um, one of the things I love about the lectionary tradition is you have, but basically what the lectionary does is to curate the Bible. And it presents to readers daily and weekly uh, a curated uh, portfolio of texts. Um, and it puts certain texts together to be read in tandem and to be in dialogue with each other. Um, I, I was very surprised when I discovered that in the Catholic, which I mean, they have daily readings and weekly readings and so on, that sizable chunks of the Bible are never read in the entire three-year lectionary cycle of the Catholic Church. And your point of that is what? That is, is that 
the church understands that there are treasures in the scripture that need to be put in front of the people on a regular basis and that there are other texts that are not all that helpful and we're going to allow them to to sit on the shelf Um, specialists and you know people who want to read the whole bible will encounter them Um, but so what i'm saying is i'm in church every week and in lectionary churches i always find a treasure or two in the four passages that are read and i always find treasures especially in the sacramental churches where you're doing eucharist every week i'm always finding treasures in the eucharistic rite um and so the bible can continually feed the spirit of the person who wants to be fed but it it does best if it is curated and if if the texts that have the greatest evidentiary kind of uh, formative, positive, formative, and spiritual power are the ones that are put in front of the people. So, in other words, right now, I would not recommend a read the Bible through campaign like some of us did when we were 18 years right. old, right? Um, I don't want people digging around a lot in Joshua. That's right. I want them in the Sermon on the Mount. And I want them in a lot of the Psalms, and I want them um, in huge chunks of the Torah and in the prophets and in some of the great epistles. So the Bible, we, we were taught the Bible had to be infallible and errant and flat with every verse having the exact same power and authority as every other verse. So slay the Amalekites has the same authority as love your enemy. That has to be abandoned. And for most of us, it has been abandoned, at least probably most people who are listening to this show. But but the 16-year-old in a fundamentalist church is not being taught that. And by the way, that's a good path out of Christianity because a smart 16-year-old might say, this is really troubling. Mm-hmm. How in the world is God this kind of God? Right? right? Um, And also it helps to understand that the Bible contains various theological and moral strands or currents or traditions or you might, you know, here's a valley over here and here's a mountaintop over here and here's, here's, here's something profound. Here's, here's one text arguing with another text. It's there. And if you can engage it that way, then it's like a treasure box full of interesting things to explore. Um, More like the great literature of of the of human civilization and less like a hundred percent accurate perfect all the time right. answer book that it's okay to say listen not all parts of the scripture are equal when when i was a biblicist yes. to your point on the slaying of the amalekites and then the beatitudes uh, oh no those things are because they're supernatural they're both equal right. no i agree so um you had mentioned this, but I want you to uh, touch on it. Uh, I was recently watching the evangelical um, biblicist John MacArthur debate, and I'm not a huge uh, fan of either of these people, I'll admit that, but John MacArthur debate the, the, uh, the devout Jew, and certainly politically right, Ben Shapiro. And I was listening to John MacArthur talk about Ben Shapiro's Hebrew scriptures. And I was kind of watching, I don't don't know. One of my best friends here in Nashville is a Jewish rabbi, uh, Flip Rice, who we are the best of friends, talk weekly. Um, So David, what what has American evangelicalism, from your perspective? And by the way, these are two. Neither what you and I are not uh, uh, Jews, so we should really be asking a Jew this question. I'm admitting that. Right, right. But what has American biblicistic evangelicalism done to the Hebrew scriptures? I think that the problem. The Old Testament. Yeah, the problem goes back further than that. So let me long view. Um, Christianity began as a Jewish messianic movement um, 
which made no sense apart from a, a reading of the Hebrew Bible and the Jewish story. And so it was probably inevitable that that when the church um, was canonizing its scriptures, it it just took uh, a version of the Hebrew Bible and just absorbed it into the Christian Bible and made the distinction of Old Testament and New Testament. And it's interesting, by the way, maybe a lot of uh, our viewers will not know that there is not a single agreed version of the Hebrew Bible among the Christian churches that you know have taken them you know because some have what we call the apocryphal books and others don't and and all that so we we don't have an agreed uh canon of the hebrew bible that we put into the christian bible um and because theological division over jesus and what to make of his ministry is at the root of the christian jewish split this means that from the beginning christianity interpreted the hebrew bible in a way that the jewish community would not have done and um, and so it was already something different by the time you have canonization in the fourth century. Um, yes. Even the arrangement of the order of the books and how the books are read and how they're used in worship and also the the loss of the Hebrew, you know, the loss of the ability to read Hebrew and Latin translations and Greek translations. In other words, it became culturally alien. Um, but permanently borrowed. <laughs> Culturally alien, but permanently borrowed. That's a really odd place to be. Um, we can't do anything about that except acknowledge it and try to do better in our own day, right? Um, I would say that what modern American evangelicalism did, well, one thing, dispensationalism um, decided to... Um, to read the history of salvation in like seven stages and um, uh, to periodize the reading of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament in a way that is not justifiable and the birth of Christian Zionism uh, and the reading of the promises of God to Abraham and thereafter as now being fulfilled in the modern state of Israel um, and therefore a recipe for a certain kind of posture towards the Israeli-Palestinian situation is something that evangelicals have uniquely contributed and I think often very destructively. Mm -hmm. um, also, I would now say that a certain kind of fundamentalist evangelical and Pentecostal reading of the politics of the, of the Hebrew Bible is maybe helping to contribute to the authoritarianism on the Christian right now you know, anointed kings and um, uh, you don't have a democracy, you have a theocracy and divine law governing the people and all of that. In other words, it is quite possible to read the Hebrew Bible as a charter for a theocracy, not a democracy. And that is something that has been brought, I think, into American political and religious conversation by evangelicals and fundamentalists. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. So you got your dispensationalism, your theocracy, and your Christian Zionism. Those are uniquely uh, uniquely evangelical, fundamentalist, and Pentecostal contributions, which I think are in many ways uh, destructive. So we're two decades into the 21st century. Uh, and I asked this question to Peter Enns, and I asked this question to Brian McLaren. Uh, so, David, where where is the Bible headed in the 21st century? What what are some encouraging things you're seeing? Um, and with this, and I don't know, with this Christ, with this faith shift evolution, uh, you and I are seeing whether it's called progressive Christianity and. You and I had a phone call one time where we said even the labels of what we call this shift are limited or phasal. So without labeling that, just this mm -hmm. this tremendous shift happening in Western evangelicalism. Where are we headed with the Bible, and where do you think we need to be headed with the Bible? Um. 
Well, the worst thing that I'm seeing is a kind of a post-Christian, almost even post-biblical, quote-unquote, evangelicalism. And by this I'm talking about the ultra-right-wing, heavily politicized, uh, you might say, foot soldiers on the right, um, vaguely identifying with Christianity, probably very, very limited engagement with the Bible or the church or the tradition. Um, I mean, at least when you're dealing with communities of people who take the Bible seriously and say it is authoritative, you can maybe have a conversation. Maybe. Oh, but what about, but have you thought about, what about the Sermon on the Mount? And you can have a fluent conversation with people who, who, who say at least they share the same Bible. So I'm most concerned about that, because at that point you're dealing with quasi or post-Christianity, kind of a culture of Christianity, heavily activated by politics, and that is a path to yeah. disaster, in my yeah. opinion. Um, you still have plenty of naive biblicism out there, um, and for a lot of people it seems like that's just never going to go away. Um, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it. There's plenty of churches like that, plenty of individuals like that. I don't think it's as many as it used to be, that's for sure, but it's out there. <clears throat> you have a significant chunk of people who are done with everything religious. They're done with Christian Christianity, they're done with church, they're done with the Bible. Um, but I also think you have a sizable community of people who are ready to engage the Bible in creative, post-fundamentalist, post-evangelical ways. And they're reading people like Pete Enns, you know? Um, and... There, these are pastors I'm meeting in the post-evangelical space who look forward to uh, taking old biblical stories and putting new takes on them and um, making some of these characters come alive as more human um, or teaching some of the conflicts and, and strains and strands of the text and, and wrestling. In other words, uh, letting the text be as complex as it actually is. Yeah. Um, so... So that's what I see. I think I just came up with four. The post-biblical, quote-unquote, Christians. The naive biblicists. Um, the the post-Christian, I'm done with this, ex-evangelical, whatever, you know. Um, and and then the um, the people who, who now have, they feel the freedom and the interest to re-engage the Bible as if for the first time. Um, they're post-fundamentalist, but they're not post-Christian, and they really want to dig in. And and I think there's some really interesting preaching happening in some of these places because um, because there's a freedom to wrestle with the text in a way that is, I think, life-giving. Mm -hmm.